I'm Dr. Leslie Blankenship Williams, and in this lecture, we are going to survey some pathogenic protists for microbiology. Now, I'm going to use a new term. It won't be new to you, but it's not one that I've really used before. And that term is parasite. And if I say the word parasite, what do you think of? Something is parasitic. Well, it probably brings to mind kind of a big pathogen. In fact, parasites are large pathogens. So when we think about all the pathogens that infect humans, we have viruses and we have bacteria and we have fungi and we have protists and we have animals like worms. On the larger end of that, particularly in the protist and the animal kingdoms, we sometimes will call those parasites rather than pathogens. So parasite is just another word for large pathogen. We're going to survey four different uh, protists that are pathogenic to humans, and I choose to cover them in order of increasing complexity with regards to their life cycle. Now, what does that mean? When we think about the life cycle of something, think about your life cycle. So your life cycle is you're a human. You grow up. How do you become something different? Well, you don't, but you create babies. So a male, a female get together, you have egg, you have, you have sperm. They come together and create a brand new human. That human grows up into either a male or a female, and the process continues. That's the life cycle. When we think about protists, we can often have some complexity with that life cycle as well. The Trichomonas vaginalis protist does not have a complex life cycle in any way, shape, or form. It's very simple. By the time we get to Plasmodium, which causes malaria, you're going to see five different life stages. So it's very complex. So this is what I mean when I say I'm covering them in order of increasing complexity. So let's start with Trichomonas vaginalis. Trichomonas vaginalis is a sexually transmitted protist, and despite the name vaginalis, it infects both males and females. In females, it infects the vagina and the cervix. In males, it infects the urethra, largely. Now this is a sexually transmitted protist, but it is often asymptomatic. And in a change from how we learned about gonorrhea and chlamydia, the asymptomatic infections are more common in males rather than females. That is to say, males don't show symptoms very often, although they can, but females that are infected will more often become symptomatic. Now, what is also interesting to me is that these protists, which live on the epithelial wall, feeding off mucus secretions and such, uh, don't grow very well when the pH is below 4.5. So that would be an acidic situation. Well, did you know that the vaginal pH is usually around 4.2? And that is largely because most vaginal microbiomes have lactobacillus in them. And lactobacillus produces lactic acid. And lactic acid brings the pH down. So Trichomonas vaginalis, when living in the vaginal environment, usually doesn't grow robustly and therefore just kind of uh, limps along in this unoptimal environment with a low pH. But you can imagine that if you had like a microflora disruption where maybe you were on broad spectrum antibiotics and your lactobacillus populations were decimated and the pH started to come up, that trichomonas that was just kind of sitting there on the side would be like, whew, now we can grow. And it starts reproducing and that causes the inflammatory response. And then you have the symptoms of, you know, intense itching and discharge. So Trichomonas vaginalis is a rather simple organism that only has one life stage to it. And that is because it is sexually transmitted. We learn from bacterial species that are sexually transmitted that they go right from one human to another with almost no time outside of the host. And consequently, they tend to be delicate types of bacteria. In the same way, Trichomonas vaginalis has a body form that is adapted to the human environment, 37 degrees warm and moist. And it doesn't need to spend any time outside in the, whole, the cold, and it doesn't need to spend any time outside in the cold, harsh world. And so therefore, it doesn't need another form. And if you're confused about what do you mean by this other form, 
It will make more sense when I get to the next one. But before I do, I would like to show you one more picture of Trichomonas vaginalis cells. Now, interestingly enough, you can actually find trichomonas uh, in urine samples when somebody is infected. And as somebody who has taught human physiology for 16 plus years now, I can say that I have seen a few urine samples with trichomonas in them. So, you know, it's out there. What is the prevalence rate? I'm not exactly sure because it's not a life-threatening infection, so it's more of an annoyance, so we don't really have good stats on it. But I did read one study that looked at the prevalence rate in Iran among women, and it was about a 1-2% to prevalence rate. So there's that. All right, let's take a look at what do I mean by this different life stage thing. So anytime you have a parasite that is going to spend some time outside of the human, now why would it spend some time outside of the human? It probably would need to as a way to get into a new human. Not every parasite has the benefit of being sexually transmitted. For instance, if you happen to infect the GI tract, then your portal of exit is probably feces. So sexual transmission is not really in the cards unless we start doing some really gross things. So it's going to have to survive out in the wastewater, out in maybe the soil, outside of a human. Where it's cold, it might be, and it might be dry, and it might be windy, and who knows, but it's not hospitable in the same way that a warm human body is hospitable. So if it's got a form that is adapted to a human body, it's probably going to need a hardier form to be outside of the human. And so we see this with our next example, which is Giardia. Now that I'm going to start with Giardia, I want to introduce some new terms, and these are terms that you will need to know for the exam. When we are looking at protists, you will often see the word trophozoite. And a trophozoite is a vegetative body, metabolically active, it will often move around or swim around. And so when we think about a trophozoite, think about the form that is in the body. When that parasite gets ready to leave via the portal of exit, whatever that may be, it's probably going to leave the human and go somewhere not quite so hospitable. And it will often form another type of body, one that is hardier, more adapted to whatever the new environment is. And often we see the term cyst show up. So a cyst is going to be a hardy form of that particular organism. And you can almost think of it a little bit like a spore or a seed. It's, it's hardier. It's got usually some sort of shell outside of it that's tough, prevents it from dehydrating. It's usually not very metabolically active. And it's meant to be a form that will survive outside of the body. And then when the cyst somehow makes it into a new human via the portal of entry, it regerminates into the trophozoite. So the process can, continues. So one organism that demonstrates this exact life cycle is Giardia. So Giardia is a gastrointestinal parasite whose major symptoms include abdominal cramping, pains, and producing copious amounts of feces or diarrhea. So let's talk about how you get Giardia. You get Giardia when you ingest spores. So spores go into the mouth, it's a portal of entry, and they get down into the digestive system and they germinate into these vegetative cells. And these vegetative cells then kind of attach to the small intestine, start replicating. You have an inflammatory response that produces a lot of diarrhea. And then of course the fecal matter swishes through the digestive system really quickly and spews out the other end. And with it, the trophozoites will die in the fecal matter because it's now outside of the human in the inhospitable world. But cysts that might have been formed from tr uh, trophozoites will persist. And so when somebody else picks up the cyst, the process repeats. So that's what we mean by this life cycle. So Giardia actually comes in a couple different species, but the one I have up here is Giardia lamblia. The reservoir for Giardia is varied, but it's largely considered to be a zoonotic disease, which means that it's mostly found in other animals that and that could include like cows and sheep and pigs and dogs, but also humans. 
We know that the transmission is oral fecal, meaning portal of entry is mouth, portal of exit is the feces, and it's global. So the global prevalence is somewhere around 1 to 2%, with a much higher prevalence rate in children and a much higher prevalence rate in underdeveloped countries. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about GRDF. My brother was at a daycare center in the early 80s. And um, when he would go to bed at night, he would be pretty gurgly. And then when he would wake up in the morning or my mother would, would take him out of the crib in the morning, he would be covered up to his neck in poop. I mean, so it would just fill his diaper up the back and up out through the neck. So you're wearing little jumpers and they'd come through. And she took him to the pedi pediatrician and said, please check him out. Something is wrong with him. Nothing's wrong with him. He's fine. Nothing's wrong with him. He's fine. And he, this went on for months and he started losing weight and he started to get malnourished. And she finally went in there and said, fine, I'm going to take him to another pediatrician, but if they find something wrong with him, I'm suing you. Well, of course, that prompted the first pediatrician to actually do a stool test and guess what they found? Giardia. And it was spread around the daycare center. So I know that when I took microbiology, I was often taught that Giardia was spread by like drinking contaminated water. But I think in the United States, you're going to see a lot more outbreaks among things like daycare centers, where one kid has it and it gets in the diapers and the fecal matter. And then other kids, because they just touch everything with their hand and put it in their mouth, pick up the cysts and put them in their mouth and then it spreads. And so that was what would happen. There was actually an outbreak at that daycare center. And it was my mother's insistence that kind of got it diagnosed. So that's my little story about Giardia. Now, Giardia is an interesting little creature in that it has two nuclei. And you can see that in the previous picture here. So it almost looks like a little owl is looking at you, like one, two. It's got the little two little eyes there, two little nuclei. It's got some flagella. And then you can see that it's got a depression that allows it to kind of like suck. And where it likes to suck is actually right on the brush border or the microvilli of the small intestine. So this is an electron micrograph. This is a scanning electron micrograph showing a Giardia lamblia cell basically sucked to the brush border of your small intestine. And when you pull it off, you can see the pock marks that are left from where it was basically uh, sectioned to. So now we use stool sample analyses to determine some, if somebody has an active Giardia infection. But another way that people used to determine if there was an active Giardia infection is that they would take a piece of string and they would wrap it up in some sort of like wax or like kind of a candy coating. And they would wrap it up and coat it with candy and have one part of the string out. And then that person would be asked to swallow basically the candy coated string. So they're holding the other piece of the string out and somebody's swallowing the string. And so of course the string goes down the esophagus into the stomach where the candy coating dissolves and then into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. And then they would take the other piece of string that they were still holding and they would tape it to the cheek. And so this person would just walk around with basically string coming out of their mouth and taped to their cheek for a couple hours. And then the doctor would yank the string out, pull everything back up, and then they would look at the very end of the string, which had been in the duodenum, under the microscope. And if that person had a Giardia infection, then the cells would actually also attach to the string and you could actually see them. I don't think anybody does that anymore, but if you see somebody walking around with tape, some tape string on their cheek, that might be what's going on. So now, let's introduce trypanosoma. Trypansoma species are blood-borne diseases. They are flagellated protist parasites that are usually transmitted by some sort of biting insect from one person to another or from an animal to a person. And they largely exist in the blood. Now you've actually seen trypansoma already in lab four, in your lab. So you were asked to look at a smear of blood and measure not only the length of a red blood cell, but also the length of a trypansome, one of these parasitic cells. So you can see that here. Now what's interesting is that the trypansomes seem to have two regions that are kind of get these stained areas. 
And so the big stained area, which is found in the middle of the body, is a stained nucleus. So the nucleus or the DNA, when you apply a stain, will usually stain dark, and so that's what you see here. But there's another place up towards the front that almost looks like an eye, and that is called a nidoplast. And the nidoplast is actually an enlarged mitochondria. So trypanosomes are defined by their enlarged mitochondria known as nidoplasts. And for that reason, they're often grouped taxonomically with a large group called nidoplastids. Again, nidoplastids just mean that they have an enlarged mitochondria that actually shows up under a microscope when you apply a stain like methylene blue or crystal violet. Now, trypansoma actually has two different species to it. Trypansoma brucei and trypansoma cruzi. Trypansoma cruzi is found in largely South America and Latin America, and it causes a disease known as Chagas's disease. Now, Chagas's disease is going to be different than the one that we're going to spend our time on. So we're going to spend our time on Trypansoma brucei, which causes African sleeping sickness. So again, there's going to be two different trypansomas, one that is found in the Americas and one that is found in Africa. The American version of this, Trypansoma cruzi, has a different disease presentation than Trypansoma brucei, and we're only going to focus on Trypansoma brucei, and that's really just because of time. So I'm going to focus on African sleeping sickness. Now African sleeping sickness is a very, very interesting and tragic disease. I've once heard it characterized as the most important disease in Africa that nobody has ever heard of. And, you know, that's a competitive list because particularly Sub-Sahara Africa has more than its fair share of infectious diseases that wreak havoc on their population and bring down their population life expectancy. So when we think about diseases that ravage, particularly Sub-Sahara Africa, diseases that might come to mind including include AIDS, it includes tuberculosis, it includes malaria, it includes Ebola, and it includes African sleeping sickness. And of those that I just mentioned, African sleeping sickness is the one that you're least likely to have heard about. So let's talk a little bit about how African sleeping sickness is spread, what the reservoirs are, and then we'll talk about the disease pathology. So African sleeping sickness, again, is caused by trypansoma brucei, and the reservoir for this is going to be humans and other mammals. And because of livestock, cows or cattle seem to be one of the more prominent mammals that act as reservoirs. The vector is a biting insect known as a tsetse fly. So cc is how we say it in the United States. Like cc, I cc the black fly, and it's a biting insect. It's actually kind of large, larger than you'd expect. And it bites somebody pulls up infected blood and then carries it to somebody else and when it bites that somebody else drops the parasite into their blood and that is largely how it is transmitted. So the initial and primary infection happens in the blood and during this stage which can go on for weeks and weeks and months and months it is more easily treated but eventually the parasite makes its way to the central nervous system or more particularly the cerebral spinal fluid. And then symptoms similar to meningitis start. So it's actually a form of meningitis. Death is guaranteed unless treated. And treatment is far more easily in the first stage than in the second stage. So let's talk about what happens and how the term African sleeping sickness came about. So you have something called a circadian rhythm. A circadian rhythm basically tells you that, you know, when you see light, we should be awake. Our cortisol levels should be up, we're active, our sympathetic nervous system is going, and then when the lights dim, that tells our body that it's time to start going to sleep. That's our circadian rhythm. Well, one of the first symptoms of neural involvement here is a disruption in the circadian rhythm, where people sleep all day long and then are awake at night. So that's where the term came from, African sleeping sickness. And you can see that in this picture here. It's clearly daytime, but everybody's sleeping. Now, that's not what's going to kill you. 
What's going to kill you, of course, is that you have a form of meningitis, which causes brain swelling and inflammation and damage, and then you end up with all of the potential symptoms therein. Uh, motor loss, basically an inability to get sensory information and motor information um, linked together, seizures, paralysis, uh, comas, and then eventually death. One question that I found really fascinating is this. This is a blood-borne disease, but the parasite is extracellular. That means it's out in the blood where any immune cell can see it. Remember that your blood has a large number of immune cells, including neutrophils, which are phagocytes. So why aren't we just coating these things in antibodies and eating them up? Well, it turns out that we try, but this parasite plays a really interesting game of cat and mouse. And it's ingenious for the parasite and terrible for us. So let me describe how this happens. Remember that antibodies bind to antigens. So let's say you have a parasite and it throws up antigens A, B, and C. That's what's displayed on the cell surface of one of these trypanosomes. So your immune system sees these antigens and activates healthier T cells and B cells. Remember, no cytotoxic T cells are going to be activated here because it's not an intracellular pathogen. It stays outside of the blood. So it's going to activate helper T cells and B cells, and then the B cells are going to make antibodies to A, B, and C. So that's going to basically increase in the bloodstream. And then that should allow your macrophages and your neutrophils to grab onto it and phagocytose it. Problem solved, right? Yeah, for a little bit. That's exactly what happened. And so these antibodies come rushing out into the blood. The phagocytes finally have something to grip. They start eating up these parasites and the parasites do something really interesting. They start altering their plasma membrane. They start taking down A, B, and C. And then they're like, we're gonna put up C, D, and F instead. So they put up new antigens. So they change out their antigens. Well now, Antibodies for A, B, and C don't do anything because A, B, and C are no longer displayed. Now it's D, E, and F. Okay, so now your immune system needs to, guess what? <laughs> Make antibodies for D, E, and F, and it does. And about a week later, antibodies for D, E, and F come sweeping through the bloodstream. Antibodies bind to the parasite, and your neutrophils and macrophages start increasing their phagocytosis rate. The numbers drop, and the remaining parasites take out D, E, and F and start putting out G, H, and I. Rinse, repeat. So you play this game over and over and over again, and the parasite keeps outwitting you by changing up its antigen presentation so that your antibodies are rendered ineffective and you have to make new ones. Anybody who has been sick, even with a cold, knows that anytime you bring out large quantities of antibodies, it just wipes you out. I mean, it drains you to have an immune response of that quantity. And you're doing this over and over and over again, and meanwhile, it's working on trying to find its way into your uh, central nervous system. And once it's in your central nervous system, death is basically inevitable unless you get some sort of rapid medical treatment. So it plays antigen, cat and mouse, with your immune system, which is tragic, but also incredibly fascinating. We tend to think of pathogens and parasites as being kind of simplistic, but you can see here that's ingenious and very clever. So that is how people are unable to combat a pathogen that's in plain sight. All right, now that we have covered African sleeping sickness, we are going to finish up with malaria. Now malaria is caused by plasmodium and there are at least five species of plasmodium. The two most clinically significant are Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax. Most people are aware that Plasmodium, which causes malaria, is transmitted by some sort of mosquito, that a mosquito is the vector for malaria. Now, if you look at the distribution of malaria, you can see that the tropics are where it's at. And again, that is largely because that is where the vector is. 
That said, over 90% of malarial cases are identified in sub-Saharan Africa, and currently it's responsible for somewhere around 400,000 deaths per year, again, largely in Africa. Africa bears the brunt of the malarial load. So malaria is also a blood-borne disease. In other words, the parasite infects the blood. But unlike trypanosoma, plasmodium is an intracellular pathogen. It gets inside our red blood cells. So that renders it relatively invisible to our immune system. Red blood cells do not have a nucleus. If they don't have a nucleus, they cannot make MHC1. If they don't make MHC1, there's no way to alert the immune system that the red blood cell is infected. So plasmodium is the winner in terms of smart choices of cells to infect. Now you'll see here that it looks like there seems to be several different life stages. And in fact, we're gonna cover five in the next drawing. But just to get you aware of what you might be looking at, you'll recognize the word trophozoite. So that's gonna be a form that is vegetative. It's in our body. Merozoite, gametocyte. The word gametocyte looks like it has the word gamete in it. And so here's the gametocyte. And the merozoite looks like this. And then another one that's not shown that's called sporozoite. So let's take a look at how that life cycle works out. The first thing I'm going to do is draw out what the different stages actually look like under a microscope. So since red blood cells are often our target, we need to know what they often look like inside a red blood cell. The first stage I'm going to draw is called a merozoite, and it looks just like a little dot. Now I'm going to draw a gametocyte, which tends to look like a wedge of a melon inside of the red blood cell. Note that there are female and male gametocytes, so there's two different ones there. Now I'm drawing the large vegetative body that is a trophozoite, still usually contained in a red blood cell, but it takes up all of the space of the red blood cell. And finally, a sporozoite, which does not exist in a red blood cell at all. It exists by itself. The names of some of these life stages tell us a little something about what they might do. So trophozoite, we know, is a large vegetative body that is going to be well adapted to the human body. The word gametocyte has gamete at its root. Gametes are like egg and sperm. They participate in sexual reproduction. So if you had to guess, you would make a good guess if you said that male and female gametocytes are involved in sexual reproduction for the malaria parasite. The word sporozoite looks a whole lot like the word spore, which we know a spore is kind of a tough, hardy version of that particular organism. So the sporozoite is probably going to be the tough, hardy version of the malaria parasite. And the word merozoite, or marrow, kind of refers to middle. So the merozoite is found in the middle of the life cycle. To draw out the life cycle of plasmodium, I highly suggest drawing along, pausing when needed, and using some different colored pens or pencils. You'll also need a full page. So to start, we have somebody who is infected and they have male and female gametocytes that are in their blood. So this is somebody who is already infected with malaria. Next, a mosquito lands, and the mosquito starts drawing up blood, and they're gonna draw up a bunch of red blood cells. And part of the rule is that the mosquito must draw up both a male and a female gametocyte for the life cycle to continue. So the male and the female gametocytes that get drawn up by the mosquito, and by the way, these can be from different meals and therefore different people, but once inside the mosquito's gut, these male and female gametocytes are going to fuse together. And when they fuse together, that creates a genetically distinct new plasmodium individual, much like we create new babies when egg and sperm come together. So, this new form is going to be a sporozoite. 
Now the sporozoite is then going to replicate and create identical sporozoites. And then the sporozoites are going to migrate up to the salivary glands of the mosquito. Now the mosquito is ready to infect a new person. So the mosquito lands on a fresh host, bites the new person, and drops those sporozoites into the wound that the mosquito has created as part of the bite. The sporozoites then travel through that new person's blood until it finds its way to the liver. The liver has a lot of cells known as hepatocytes, and the hepatocytes are going to be the target of these sporozoites. So now I'm going to draw out some hepatocytes, which are just generic liver cells. Again, these are the target of the newly introduced sporozoites. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how the plasmodium parasite changes during the course of the infection in the liver. So the first thing that happens is the sporozoite creates a tip. And that tip allows it to kind of wiggle its way inside the hepatocyte. And so now it's inside the hepatocyte. Now it's going to change into a merozoite form. And the merozoite form is going to replicate. So the sporozoite becomes merozoites inside the hepatocytes. Lots of sites. So once the hepatocyte has between, oh, I don't know, 6 to 12 merozoites, then all of the infected hepatocytes, because there's always more than one, are going to lice at the same time. This is known as a coordinated release. So basically what happens is all of these merozoites try to get out at the same time from all of their infected liver cells. And this is on purpose because when they are inside the liver cell, they're actually vulnerable to alerting the immune system that you know the liver cells are infected and that they should be targeted for destruction. And by getting out all at once, what happens is it overwhelms the immune system. And the liver is very bloody. So if you remember from anatomy, the liver gets lots of different types of blood. So it doesn't take very long for these merozoites to quickly find their way into blood. And now the merozoites are going to try to infect red blood cells. So although the immune system might clean up some of the merozoites at this point, many of them will find their target cell, which is the red blood cell. So now we're going to draw the life cycle of the plasmodium parasite in the red blood cells. It starts with the merozoite attaching to a red blood cell. This allows the merozoite to create a tip that allows them to penetrate the red blood cell. Once they're inside the red blood cell, they start to do this germination thing where they almost create like a set of horns. And the horns, when they come out, create almost a ring structure. And so sometimes this is called the ring formation or the ring structure. So the merozoite germinates with these cytoplasmic extensions that create a ring. And that's just cytoplasm germinating out of the merozoite, and it keeps spreading, and it starts consuming all of the things in the red blood cell, and it eventually creates a mass, a cellular mass, and that's when you have a trophozoite. So in the ring formation, that's really the earliest trophozoite form, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets even bigger as it consumes more and more of the red blood cell. And eventually, it takes up the entire space of the red blood cell. And once it does that, now it's ready to go ahead and divide again. It has consumed all of the resources in the red blood cell, and it's going to divide itself back up, almost like a pie. So I have here, I've kind of drawn it out like a pie, or sliced it up like a pie. And it's going to divide itself back up into about 6 to 12 different merozoites. And then the red blood cell is going to lice, the merozoites will be released, and the process continues. And this basically happens indefinitely until either the person dies, 
or the person gets on anti-malarial medication. Now, we started our story with gametocytes, so where did those come from? Well, it turns out that a small percentage of trophozoites take a different route. Rather than dividing themselves back up into merozoites, they instead differentiate or morph into either male or female gametocytes. You can't be both, so you're either a male or a female gametocytes. And then the male and female gametocytes just hang around in the blood waiting to be picked up by a mosquito. And if they are successfully picked up by a mosquito, then the life cycle continues into a new host. So that concludes our lecture on the life cycle of malaria. Thanks for sticking with it, and I'll see you in the next lecture.